Hello. Oh my God, there's been a murder. There's been a murder. Oh, yeah. there's been, oh my God. I don't even know the address. Come on, give me where you are. What's the two in the street? Oh, baby, are you okay? Baby, baby. That was Lyle Scheidemann, Lisa Rucker's boyfriend, who made the 911 call. Lisa and her sister Ashley lived together in a condo with their two young boys. Ashley invited her abusive ex-boyfriend over on Halloween night. His name is Chad Absher. It didn't take long for an argument to break out between Chad and Ashley, which quickly escalated into violence. Two shots were fired, and both sisters were hit in the head. One sister died, while the other survived. Chad claimed that Ashley had tried to shoot him, but she accidentally shot Lisa instead. Then, during a struggle for the rifle, it went off, and Ashley was shot accidentally. But what really happened on that Halloween night? Was Chad telling the truth? Or did he shoot Ashley and Lisa? Let's unpack this horrifying case. Christina Ashley Rucker was born on November 5, 1986 in the vibrant city of Miami, Florida to parents Roger and Elizabeth Rucker. She had two sisters, Jennifer and Lisa, and a brother named Christopher. Although her first name was Christina, she preferred to be called by her middle name, Ashley. As she transitioned into her 20s, Ashley's commitment to caring for others defined her professional path. She started working in healthcare and began her journey in a call center. With time and experience, she advanced to the role of a medical assistant. Among her siblings, Ashley shared a unique connection with her sister, Lisa. The two sisters formed an inseparable bond, often spending time together. On a sunny afternoon in April 2014, Ashley and Lisa found themselves at their grandmother's house in Jacksonville, Florida, celebrating her birthday. Both sisters, who were single mothers at the time, were watching their sons play together in the yard. As they sat outside, their attention was drawn to a handsome man across the street. He was giving a few children a ride on a lawnmower. The sight was too enticing for Ashley's son, who approached the man and asked if he could join the ride. Intrigued by the handsome man with the lawnmower, Lisa and Ashley crossed the street and struck up a conversation with the man who introduced himself as Chad Absher. With a friendly introduction, Chad shared a bit about his journey, revealing that he had started his own lawn care business after his time in prison. Ashley, captivated by Chad's story and his good looks, found herself drawn to him. There was an instant, undeniable connection between the two. As weeks passed, their connection deepened, and they officially began dating. The blossoming romance unfolded with promise, and the following year saw the couple taking a significant step in their relationship. They decided to move in together. A short while after Ashley and Chad started living together, a disturbing incident occurred. Lisa's phone rang, and it was Chad on the other end. His words sent a chill down her spine. Your sister's going crazy. Confused and worried, Lisa pressed him for more information. Chad then said, We were arguing and going back and forth, and she stabbed herself in the stomach. Lisa, gripped by concern, urged Chad to dial 911. Recognizing the gravity of the situation and the immediate need for medical assistance. Police records show that an officer was dispatched to their residence just after 11 p.m. for a suicide attempt. However, by the time they arrived, Chad informed the police that Ashley had run away. This prompted the police to issue a missing persons report. Within a few hours, Ashley was found less than seven miles away. She was discovered in the back of her car, parked in a hotel lot, lying on the floor with a deep wound in her stomach. The severity of her injury necessitated immediate medical attention. Later, Lisa received a call from the hospital. She was informed that Ashley had been placed under security measures because she claimed that she had stabbed herself. As the doctors examined Ashley, they grew increasingly convinced that her injuries were not self-inflicted. Lisa was informed that the nature of the wound made it almost physically impossible for Ashley to have stabbed herself through her abdominal wall. 
The knife had penetrated so deeply that the doctors were uncertain if any organs had been punctured, necessitating immediate emergency surgery. It dawned on Lisa that the doctor's primary concern was not about protecting Ashley from herself. In fact, they even had her registered under a fake name in order to protect her from the person who they believed had stabbed her. Upon her release from the hospital, Ashley stayed with her father for a while, but eventually she and Chad got back together. According to Lisa, any time Ashley was doing whatever Chad wanted her to do, things were great between them. Then there would be a blow-up, sometimes the police would be called, and Ashley would go and stay with her father again. It was like a never-ending cycle that left Lisa feeling helpless and unsure of how to intervene. It was clear to her that Ashley was under Chad's control. The situation was further complicated by Chad's volatile temper and his possession of a firearm. Their argument sometimes escalated to the point where Chad would pull out his gun. On one occasion, he even struck Ashley on the head with it. Ashley's father Roger said that she came to him about 30 times complaining about Chad. Even though Ashley left him multiple times, each time she got back together with him, the physical abuse continued. He didn't seem to care about the fact that everyone knew he was abusive towards Ashley. On one particularly horrific occasion, he assaulted Ashley so severely that she required hospitalization. In a shocking display of audacity, Chad posted images of Ashley's injuries on his Facebook page, seemingly boasting about his actions. Each time Chad physically abused Ashley, he wasn't arrested. Authorities claim it was because Ashley refused to press charges. However, Roger revealed that the police had issued stern warnings to his daughter about the imminent danger she was in. They had cautioned her repeatedly that if she continued to stay with Chad, she could end up dead. These dire warnings finally began to resonate with Ashley. In the summer of 2017, Ashley found the courage to break up with Chad and decided to make a fresh start away from him. She had gotten her tattoo of Chad's name covered up, and instead of moving in with her father again, Ashley turned to her sister, Lisa. Whenever Lisa was around, Chad never put his hands on Ashley, so she thought that by being near Lisa, it would protect her from Chad. So Lisa and Ashley moved into a condo together with their young sons. It seemed for a brief moment that Ashley was stepping into a new chapter of her life. However, like many victims of domestic violence, Ashley found herself drawn back to her abuser. Not long after settling into her new home, she allowed Chad to visit. Chad seemed to have turned over a new leaf and behaved himself during the first visit. Ashley then invited Chad over a second time, which was on Halloween. The evening started off pleasantly, with Lisa and Ashley ordering pizza for their sons. The gathering wasn't limited to just them. Lisa's new boyfriend, Lyle Scheidemann, was also present. As the evening progressed, tension between Chad and Ashley began to build. She asked him for her car keys, but he insisted he had given it back to her. She knew he was lying because every time he stuck his hand in his pocket and said, I don't have your keys, she could hear it jingling in his pocket. So she persisted and said, Give me my car keys. I have to go to work tomorrow. Please give me my car keys. Despite her pleas, Chad continued to deny possession of the keys escalating the tension in the room. Out of frustration, Ashley approached Chad from behind and snatched her car keys from his jacket pocket. With the keys finally in her possession, Lisa believed the night's drama had come to an end. She assumed that Chad, having been asked to leave multiple times, would either leave or lay down on the couch and go to sleep. Lisa then went to her room with Lyle to watch a movie. Then in a state of panic, Ashley's son, Joseph, came running into her room saying, Chad is choking mommy. He won't let her go. Lisa and Lyle hurried to Ashley's room, only to be met with a distressing sight. Chad had Ashley in a chokehold, one arm tightly wrapped around her neck. Lyle stepped forward and confronted Chad, creating a momentary distraction that allowed Ashley to break free and make a desperate escape from the room. As Chad rose from the bed, Lisa, determined to put an end to the escalating violence, warned him that she was calling the police. In the past, any time Lisa threatened to call the police, Chad would immediately leave. Lisa hoped this would be the case again, but to her surprise, Chad stood his ground, 
refusing to leave. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Lisa wasted no time and dialed 911. Okay, who was that? Your boyfriend? Your brother? No, it's my sister's boyfriend. Does anyone have any weapons? Is he drinking drugs or what? No. All right, we'll send the next available officer out there. Call us back if anything changes, okay? Okay, thank you. During her call with the 911 operator, Lisa was asked if a gun was involved. She initially denied it, but after ending the call, she found out that there was indeed a firearm in the apartment. Earlier in the evening, Ashley had hid Chad's rifle away after he started acting erratic and became angry. Lisa then reminded Chad that the police were on their way, hoping that would scare him and compel him to leave, but instead of leaving the premises, Chad reacted aggressively, pushing Lisa out of the way. This caused Lyle to go after Chad, and a fight between the two broke out. Lyle initially appeared to have the upper hand, but the fight took a dangerous turn when Ashley said to Lisa, this fight needs to end because Chad has a gun. Realizing the potential for disaster, the sisters intervened and managed to pull Lyle off of Chad. After the altercation, Lyle stepped outside. Chad was visibly injured, with cuts on his face, and there was blood all over the place. Despite Ashley's repeated pleas for him to leave, he continued to pace restlessly around the condo. Lisa, wanting to preserve the scene for the police, but also wanting to prevent their young sons from seeing the blood, began to clean up the blood. Ashley joined her in the cleanup. Chad then wiped his bloody face with Lisa's hair, so she screamed at him to get out of her house. But then, the situation took a horrifying turn when Chad retrieved his hidden rifle from behind a chair cushion and aimed it at Lisa. She didn't think he would shoot her, she thought he was merely trying to intimidate her. But as she turned her head away from him, he shot her, and then he shot Ashley as well. Both sisters were shot in the back of the head. A neighbor heard the terrifying shots and called 911. Jackson, I want one with a location of the emergency. Hi, um, I'm not sure. I believe somebody at the apartment just got shot. Okay, um, I need to. What's the apartment Mr. complex? Uh, Cedar Creek Landing. Was it a male or female? I'm not sure. Okay. After shooting the sisters, Chad fled the scene. Then Lyle went back into the apartment and immediately called 911. Hello? Oh my God, there's been a murder. There's been a murder. What's the been, oh my God. What's the I don't even know the address. Okay, come on, give me where you are. What's the two in the street? Baby, are you okay? Baby, 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 are you okay? The address is up. What's the address? I don't know the address. Come on, on the phone. He saw him in the head. I'm over here at the apartment. Oh my God. Oh my God. In the aftermath of the horrifying events, the two sisters lay lifeless in pools of their own blood. An unimaginable tragedy witnessed by their young sons, Joseph and Colton, aged nine and four. The children, traumatized by the night's events, cried in anguish as they faced the grim reality unfolding before them. Lisa regained consciousness amidst the chaos. Hearing her son Colton's desperate plea, Mommy, please don't die, she mustered the strength to reassure him, saying, I'm okay, baby, I'm okay. But Lisa was far from okay. By the time the police arrived, Chad had already fled the scene, leaving behind a scene of devastation. Tragically, Ashley didn't survive the attack and was pronounced dead at the scene. Lisa, clinging to life, was rushed to the hospital. Her condition was critical. Having sustained a gunshot wound to the back of her head and lost a significant amount of blood, her chances of survival seemed bleak. After a two-day manhunt, Chad was caught and charged with murder, attempted murder, and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. The one charge that held the key to how this whole tragedy could have been prevented is the third charge, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. That's because Chad had been convicted for stalking an ex-girlfriend and shooting at her house 12 years prior. Back in 2005, 
Chad entered into a relationship with a high school student in Jacksonville, Florida, where they both lived. Their relationship lasted for about a year before she decided to end it. Unable to accept the breakup, Chad's behavior escalated into a disturbing pattern of stalking. His actions became increasingly dramatic and unsettling. On the night of February 25, 2006, at around 2.30 a.m., a neighbor was disturbed by loud music emanating from a car parked outside Chad's ex-girlfriend's house. Recognizing Chad, the neighbor confronted him and managed to chase him away. But Chad returned later and fired seven shots into his ex-girlfriend's house before fleeing the scene. Fortunately, no one was injured. Facing the inevitability of his arrest, Chad decided to turn himself in. He ultimately pleaded guilty to the charges of shooting or throwing deadly missiles and aggravated stalking. The court handed down a sentence of four years in prison, and Chad was prohibited from owning or using a firearm for the remainder of his life. A violation of this prohibition, such as being found in possession of a firearm, would result in a 15-year prison sentence. Shockingly, just six months before Ashley was murdered, she had reported that Chad had threatened her with a gun. This was stated in an actual police report, so the police were made aware that Chad possessed a firearm. This leads us to the million-dollar question. If the police knew that Chad had a firearm and he was supposed to be arrested for being in possession of one, why didn't they arrest him? When the Jacksonville Sheriff's Department were asked why Chad wasn't arrested, they said it was a probation issue. Had Chad been arrested, it's unlikely that Ashley and Lisa would have been shot, and Ashley might still be alive. Fortunately, Lisa survived. The bullet ricocheted off her skull, broke her jaw, and came out the left side of her face. A month after being shot, Lisa was able to talk and walk again and was expected to make a full recovery. Understandably, she wants Chad to spend the rest of his life in prison. I hope he's in jail for the rest of his life. I hope he gets hurt every day because we have to hurt every day that she's not here. During the trial, Chad took the stand in his defense, telling jurors that on the night of the shootings, he was sleeping, and Lyle, Lisa's boyfriend, attacked him in his sleep. So after you went to sleep, what do you remember happening next? I got woke up to being beat in my sleep. Who was beating you? That was on top of me. What was he doing? Beating me in my face. Instead of fighting back, Chad claimed that he had begun to collect his belongings to leave the apartment, but he was stopped by Ashley, who he alleged pointed a rifle at him. He then told the jury that when Ashley pulled the trigger, she inadvertently shot Lisa, who was standing behind him in the living room. Chad explained that he then grabbed the rifle because he was half drunk and on sleep meds, after which a second shot went off, hitting Ashley in the head. Ashley was coming this way because I'm just pouring blood at the time. And behind this couch cushion, she held the gun. From this point, Lisa gets hit. And I'm like this. And I spin around and grab the gun. And when I twist the gun and yank it, her hand goes around to stop. And she drops. Chad also claimed that the reason why Ashley tried to shoot him was because he had messed around with Lisa. However, Lisa had taken the stand and testified that it was Chad, not Ashley, who shot her in the face, matching statements she'd previously given to police officers on the night of the shooting. After the conclusion of the trial, the jury took just an hour and a half to deliberate. The evidence against Chad was overwhelming, and he was found guilty on all charges. The court handed down the harshest sentence possible, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. This tragic and disturbing case highlights the complex and often misunderstood dynamics of domestic violence. Victims like Ashley face a multitude of challenges when attempting to break free from abusive relationships. The cycle of abuse is not just physical, but also psychological, involving manipulation, fear, and control. Despite the many warnings from her family and the police, Ashley found herself drawn back into the abusive relationship a testament to the powerful hold an abuser can have over their victims. It's a stark reminder of the importance of understanding and addressing the complexities of domestic violence in order to better support and protect those who find themselves caught in such situations.
It's easy to put the blame on Ashley and claim that she could have avoided being killed if she simply cut ties with Chad, but it's never that simple. Oftentimes, women leave abusers like Chad and still end up getting killed, despite having restraining orders in place. This is one of the reasons why women sometimes remain in abusive relationships, out of fear of being killed if they leave. It's crucial to recognize that domestic violence is never the fault of the victim, and understanding the complexities involved can help dispel harmful misconceptions surrounding this pervasive issue. Ashley's tragic story highlights the critical need for proper support systems and resources that empower the many victims of domestic violence. It's essential to create an environment that encourages victims to seek help, rather than placing blame on them for their circumstances. Society as a whole needs to focus on providing safe spaces, counseling services, legal assistance, and other forms of support to help victims break free from the cycle of abuse so they can rebuild their lives. This is a collective responsibility that requires empathy, understanding, and action from all of us. We would like to send our deepest and most heartfelt condolences to Ashley's family and friends, her son Joseph and her sister Lisa. May God comfort and strengthen you all, and may Ashley's soul rest in eternal peace.